Good morning, Times Square Church. The, I have a special prayer on my heart this morning. When Jesus stood up in the, in the synagogue, there was brought to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And then he said these words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. I have a prayer in my heart that God do all of these things this morning. That on a specific topic that he's given me to speak on on this uh, church congregation this morning. From Psalm 142, please, if you can go there. Psalm 142. The title of my message this morning is Bring My Soul Out of Prison. Bring my soul out of prison. Now, Father, Lord God, I can't deliver this with any power unless you choose to empower it. There's nothing I can say here that will bring about any kind of victory unless you give it. Lord, you have to empower me. You have to enable me. You have to enable us as a congregation to hear this. You have to give us the desire for this. And Lord, you've got to do it because it can't be done. There's nothing in us that can do this. We can give it our best effort and fall short of the glory that you would have in your church. And so, Father, I come not in a position of strength but in weakness. I don't come with any great confidence in myself, but I have confidence in you, Lord. I have confidence in your word. I have confidence in the thoughts that you put upon my heart. Give us the grace to hear this. Lord Jesus Christ, open prison doors and set us free, Lord. Those that have been bruised and wounded, those who don't see a way into this, that you're, th- this truth that you're going to speak about, those who feel that they'll never be free, I pray, God Almighty, that you do a miracle today. Do the miraculous, Lord. I ask you for a supernatural work in this church this morning, Lord. I, I know this can't be done by any goodwill. Of man, Nothing would, would be done that lasts. It has to be a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I yield to this. I yield my body to it, O oh God, and this church to it. And I ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, to do this work so profoundly, so deeply, Lord, that we would be stunned and amazed in the days ahead at what you have done. That there could be nobody pointing in any direction but you. There be only one testimony. Jesus has done this. And Father, I thank you for it with all my heart today in your precious name. Amen. Psalm 142, bring my soul out of prison. Verse 1, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed him before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I have walked, they have privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand, and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Now this is a song, this is a testimony of someone anointed by God, King David of Israel. He was anointed for the purpose of bringing honor to God's name and gladness and security to the people of God. Yet partway into his journey... He finds himself in a place that is very familiar to some of us here today. Verses 1 and 2, he said, I cried with my voice. I made supplication. I poured out my complaint before him and I showed him my trouble. There's a specific prayer that I think many people here have been praying in this local church body. And here's the question. If I am a part of what is your testimony on the earth... If this indeed is your body, if this, is, if this church or the church is your body, 
and it is my family, my new family on the earth. If being one with these people is supposed to bring fulfillment into my life and glory to your name, then why do I still feel so alone? Why can't I integrate? Why can't I experience the love, the security, and the joy that is supposed to be here? We sing about it. We talk about it. We read about it. Uh, it, it seems to be everywhere and for many others. But why am I on the outside looking in? Why can't I bond with people? What is it about me that I'm sitting in a crowd? In verse 4, he said, I look on my right hand, and behold, there's no man that would know me. And refuge failed me. No one seemingly cared for my soul. I'm sitting in a crowd, yet I can't seem to form any kind of meaningful friendship with anyone. There's 8,000 people attend this church. And there are some people in here that's exactly the cry of your heart. Why am I still alone? Why can't I fit in? Why can't I integrate? What is it? What will set me free? Why, why do I feel so lonely? Verse 6, he said, I'm brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they're stronger than I am. There are voices, and they're, they're stronger than my reasonings, and they're telling me that I'll never fit in. There's something wrong with me. People don't like me. I might as well just give up. I'll never fit in. Maybe it works for other people, but it seems to be a lost cause for me. Anybody here ever felt that way in church? Verse 7, he says, Bring my soul out of prison that I might praise thy name. Oh, God, help me. God, help me. What is it about this generation that it seems to be so hard to bond one with another? It's so hard to trust. Now, there are many reasons why people feel that way today. Now, this is a church of over 100 different nationalities. That in itself is an integration nightmare, apart from the spirit of Almighty God. God had an idea in his heart. The statisticians say it can't be done. You cannot even bring two cultures together and have harmony let alone over 100 in one church body. There are just too many differences. The statisticians say, no, you have to build the churches around uh, typical race, typical socioeconomic conditions. You have to target. You have to move into different stratas of society. And the Lord, I think the Lord just said hogwash to the whole thing. <laughs> I'm going to... Bring together a church of a hundred nations and do a miracle when people say it can't be done. Number one, you can't, statisticians told Pastor David Wilkerson, you can't form a church in the middle of Times Square. It will never work. Well, here we are. The Lord said it's going to take a specific kind of skilled leadership to guide these people into this form of integration. So God looked down from heaven years ago because he knew this church would be here. And he saw an angry, fearful, whiskey-drinking police officer that was afraid of crowds. Said, okay, that would be a good senior pastor. <laughs> and then he, he saw a Haitian American throwing his parents' furniture all over his li their living room and said, well, no, that would make a great uh, youth leader. And then he saw an African-American homeless man out living in Central Park and sleeping on the trains. And he said, now that would be a, an incredible Bible teacher. <laughs> then he took an 87-year-old man who lives four hours from the church and said, now that would be a, a great voice for passion and righteousness in the church and he'd do a great job leading the seniors in the church. And he said, to top it all off and to add a whole other dimension to this, I'm going to put a woman on the platform who's got a greater anointing than all of them put together. If this church were a nightmare, then God just added to it immeasurably and put a leadership over it that in the natural is doomed to failure, except that God's spirit and his ways are not our ways. Now, many, many people here today, you're in a new culture. And that in itself can be hard to adjust to because of the unfamiliarity of it all. You know, various 
cultures throughout the world have different meanings. Many people don't fully understand this yet. That's why the integration of a hundred different nations can be so difficult. Eye contact means different things in different societies. In one part of the world, eye contact means disrespect. In another part of the world, eye contact means honesty. That's America. Look me in the eye, son. <laughs> and so we're out in the lobby trying to talk to somebody from, from a typical Asian culture who thinks it's disrespectful to look you in the eye. And you're trying to, you're like this, trying to have a conversation. <laughs> you walk away saying, what is wrong with that person? They won't look me in the eye. And the other person is walking away saying, wow, that was in incredibly dishonoring. That person just kept staring at me the whole time we were talking. <laughs> How about personal space? It's different in different parts of the world. Like in typical North America, uh, we have about a two and a half to three foot no-fly zone. You know, in our lives all around us, <laughs> like you're not allowed in this circle. I mean, talk to me, fine. You know, my wife is allowed there, my grandchildren are allowed there, and, and maybe a few other people, but the general population just, just don't get any closer than my three-foot circle. But what about East, East Indian culture, where the, the generally accepted social distance is six inches? And so you go out to the lobby after a service, and you want to be friendly to people, and you start talking to somebody who's, who's from an East Indian background. And a person just walks right up into your face like that and starts talking to you. You can't even hear what they're saying because you're, you're just exploding inside saying, what is this person doing so close to my face? And so you back up. And the other per an East Indian guy says, well, I just want to be intimate with this person. So he steps forward and you back up. He steps forward. And it looks like you're doing a dance around the rotunda. How about just common understandings in different cultures of respect? For example, in traditional Japanese culture, if uh, you ask a person a question and what they will do is pause for 15 seconds or so to, to, to let you know that I respect you as a person, I respect what you've just asked me, and I'm giving very thoughtful consideration. So you walk up to a traditional Japanese person in the, in the lobby after the service and say, did you enjoy the service today? The next thing you know, they're standing there and they close their eyes. They're standing before you. And if, if you're like I am, you lean in and you, and you say it louder, Did you enjoy the service today? <laughs> then we have the barrier of, of voice intonation. There, there are various voice intonations that are culturally learned throughout the world. In America, for example, we have a low pitch drop at the end of our sentences, just like I just did right there. If you were to graph my voice, if I'm in a friendly mood, at the end of every sentence would be what's called a low pitch drop. A low pitch drop at the end of my sentence. And so I would say to you, if I were an usher, say in Times Square Church, I would say, good to see you. Come in. Sit down. It's, it's a low pitch drop. Well, what about uh, other cultures, for example, India, that don't have a low pitch drop? They've not learned to speak culturally the way we do. So it's just, good to see you. Come in. Sit down. Now, to, to our ear, that's the way it sounds. But, and, and a person is wondering, why, why is everybody so offended by me? I, I'm just being polite. And you, you understand that there's, there's intonations of the voice that are different in different cultures. Now, some cultures, now this is strictly advice for those who are born and bred in New York City. When you say, I hope to see you next week, they really think you mean it. And so you come to church next week, and there's brother, sister, so-and-so in the lobby waiting for you. <laughs> following you down the aisle to your seat because you said, I'll look forward to seeing you next week and having fellowship with you. And they thought you really meant it. So be careful what you say. Now, I'm just giving you a, a, a really quick overview of all of the cultural faux pas that go on when you have a hundred nations meeting together that show you and I that without Christ, it's impossible. Without Christ, there never will be a United Nations. W without Christ, we never will be able to break the barriers. And, and of course, you, you're coming into a, a church like this. If, if you are a little bit insecure in the, in the first place, it makes it even worse to try to integrate, to try to make a friend, to try to get to know people because you're operating within a, a certain cultural framework. 
and cueing and miscueing constantly in, in your conversations. Now, of course, there are other people here that have a hard time to be part of the church body because you've been betrayed, you've been abandoned, you've been abused. And it's so hard to trust again because to trust is to be vulnerable. And to be vulnerable means you open yourself up. You're, you're letting people in, into that inner proximity as it is. And you're letting people get close to you who could hurt you again. And I wish I could tell you that that would never happen again. But unfortunately, that's not true. It can happen. Even in the church of Jesus Christ. And there's even others, just like I used to be, who are just awkward with crowds and awkward with people. And... You're in a crowd, but you feel like you're not of the crowd. You, you, you want intimacy and fellowship, but you're not quite sure how to do this. I remember when I was a young Christian, we'd go to church, Pastor Teresa and I, and people walk up to me and say, I love you, brother. And I'd say, uh-huh. <laughs> and that, I was so awkward with that. It was like I never had another man tell me he loved me. And... It was awkward for me. I have to be really honest with you. And, and Pastor Tracy used to say to me, why don't, you, why don't you tell them I love you back? And I said, because I don't love them. I, I mean, I, I love you. I love my kids. I love my mother. I, but I don't. I don't. I don't. I'm not, I'm not going to say it. I don't mean it. And it's hard. You know, I, I can say it now. But it was so hard to break that barrier of, of, of what is accepted and what's not accepted and, and how we're supposed to interrelate with people and how we shouldn't. And it was a very difficult moment. How do we break through to the satisfying experience that Christ says clearly being part of his church should be? Now, he says it in John chapter 17. I want you to read it with me, please. John chapter 17 beginning at verse 21. Now, Jesus makes it clear that being part of the church body should be a deeply satisfying experience, spiritually speaking, which should ultimately bring glory to God in the earth. It should be so satisfying, so fulfilling, that people look at the church of Jesus Christ and technically say, only God could bring about this kind of love and unity among a people. Look at verse 20. Jesus said, Neither pray I for these alone, that's John 17, 20, but for them which also shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That as you and I, Jesus said, are as Father, as you and I are interrelated, we're one, we're inseparable. We speak with one voice, we beat with one heart as it is, that they may be one in us, and that oneness in the body of Christ will be an irrefutable testimony to the world of the reality of God. You see, it's not supposed to be just a casual coming together. It's not supposed to be just a, hi, how are you on Sunday morning? There's something that God has for you and God has for me as part of his church, his body on this earth, that is to be a living testimony with, of the reality of God. And if what you have and what I have don't amount to that, then we have to have the courage, as David prayed, God, take me out of the prison that I'm in. I feel like there's four walls around me. I feel like that I'm behind bars. I feel like that there's something so much deeper for me as part of the body of Jesus Christ that I'm not experiencing. My, my fellowship in the church is not a testimony of the reality of God. For I could get along with people in, the, in, in, a, in, a, in a secular club as well as I do with the p people in the church. So, Lord, you've got to take me deeper. In verse 22, Jesus said, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. The glory means the ability, technically. The weightiness of God. The ability to perform this. He said, the glory which you gave me, I've given them for this reason, that they may be one, even as we. I gave them, Jesus said, the ability to be one as we are one. Go back one verse, for the purpose that the world may believe that Jesus Christ has been sent to it. 
I and them, verse 23, and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me, that they all may be one. So how do we do this? Hebrews 12, 3 says, Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Consider Jesus, who had to press through himself for this fellowship. It didn't, it didn't just come naturally. And there were people all around him that were making promises they weren't going to fulfill. There were people who said they loved him or were going to flee from him. And he had this contradiction, in a sense, all around him. But in his heart, he knew that the Father had sent him to gather a church. And this, the scripture tells us, though he was alone in Gethsemane and abandoned even in his hour of need. Remember David said in verse 4, he said, I looked on my right hand and no man was there that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Yet he pressed on because what was to come was worth it. And folks, there's, there's a measure of fellowship that God has for you and I that we're going to have to press on to achieve it. We're going to have to press through our fears. We're going to have to press through the failings of other people. We're going to have to press through misunderstandings. We're going to have to press through our own inadequacies and our own struggles and trials because the end result is worth it. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Who for the joy that was set before him went to the cross. The joy of fellowship with you and I, both now in time and forever, for the joy that was set before him. For the joy that's supposed to be evident in the body of Christ. For the joy that should be known when people see you and I walking down the street together. Even under normal circumstances, there should be something in the, in the passerby that says, Wow, there's something, there's a bond there. Not like the world gives. The world promises bonds, but they're all conditional and some of them are quite perverted. But there's something pure here. There's something right here. When they hear your conversation, when they see you and I interacting together, there should be something in that fellowship that's worth pressing through to have it. I'm not willing to sit in isolation in the body of Christ, and neither should you be. We should be willing to press through. Press through all the struggles, the trials, considering Christ for the joy He endured what he had to endure that he might have fellowship with you and I today. If Jesus Christ broke through for us, then the question is, how do I break through the barriers that want to keep me out of this joy as part of his church? Now go to Acts chapter 4, please, with me. In this particular chapter of Scripture, in chapter 4, the disciples were up against a threatening that wanted to take their testimony away. And so they went to prayer. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 29, he says, they said, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant to thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. In other words, God Almighty, there's, there are voices that want to threaten to keep me isolated. They're telling me that I'll never break through into the beauty as it is a fellowship in the body of Jesus Christ. I'll never know love the way God wants me to know it for other people while I'm on this earth. They are threatening me. They're threatening the testimony of Christ in my life. But, oh God, give me the boldness to speak first. Give me the boldness to reach out. And in verse 30, they said, by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy child Jesus. God Almighty, stretch out your hand through me to bring healing to any division, any breach, any misunderstanding, any person who's out there and alone. God, don't let me walk by. Even if I'm lonely myself, don't let me walk by another lonely person without doing something without saying something, without reaching out, without being part of the solution to whatever the dilemma in that particular life might be. And God, give me the boldness to speak. Give me the boldness to say something and mean it. 
Give me the boldness to be the first one out of the gate as it is or out of the prison house to say, I, I've noticed, I've seen you around here before. Where are you from? Engage in a conversation. Would you, would you like to go out and just have a coffee together? Sit down, talk. And if that person has a need, stretch out your hand and let the hand of God reach out through you. <laughs> to do signs and wonders, they said, in the name of thy holy child, Jesus. To do signs, to do things, God. That only can be done by the Spirit of God. They can't be done any other way. It, it's not by human reasoning. It's not by human might or power. But, oh, God, there are certain things that can only be done through the tender touch of Christ in the life of somebody who cares. And when they had prayed, the Scripture says, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the Word of God with boldness. They were shaken. And folks, you and I can remember Paul and Silas, they were in prison. And at midnight, it says they began to praise God. And I, I don't know exactly what those prayers were, but I do know it caused the shaking. And it caused not only their own bands to fall off, but it caused the prison doors of people who had lost heart and lost hope. All around them, prison doors started to open. And even an old filthy Philippian jailer, dirty in mind and spirit, evil in practice, no doubt, was set free from his prison, even though the bars weren't evident, by the tender touch of Paul's hands and Silas's hands washing the, the filth away that had become part of his life, going to his house, speaking to his children, speaking to his family, seeing the glory of God come in that house because they were not afraid to reach out, not afraid to go where People were gathering who had given their lives to Jesus Christ. And when they prayed, the place was shaken. I'm not satisfied, and neither should you be, until there's a bond of love in this house that outsiders come in and say, only Jesus could have done this. There's no other way this could happen. Oh, yes, we have a, a great measure of this unity in our midst. Don't misunderstand me. But there should never be a lonely person here. There, sh there should not be somebody who walks in here week after week after week into this church and walks out alone with that thought in their heart. Will I ever be free? Will I ever break into fellowship? That simply should not be in this house. There should be a care and a compassion one for another that staggers the imagination of those who live outside the kingdom of God. It should be genuine. It should be Holy Ghost breathed. It should have a tenderness. It should have a power behind it that does not come from human effort. It comes from the power of God being manifested through our lives. In verse 32 said, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. And neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. That's an incredible thing. Here they are. They're praying and it's a simple prayer. They said, God, break us, break us out of the box of our limitations and give us an enablement to be able to reach out. That's what it was. It was about human need. It was about not drawing back because of fear. And God, stretch out your hand through us and bring healing. The place was shaken. And the first fruit of that prayer is a divine compassion that suddenly released among the people. It's sovereign, it's supernatural. We can't ever have a, a program of compassion. It simply doesn't work. It's something God did in these people. They didn't, they didn't have a, a program. It just said suddenly, the multitude of them were of one heart and one soul. There's a sudden releasing of things that we hold to ourselves as if our lives depended on these things. And there's a sudden caring and compassion for the whole church body. Amazing, as you see, a divine compassion moved together with divine enablement. And it says in verse 33 that great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. They were given a divine enablement to bond together. It was the degree of which they had never known before. Great power and great grace. The people would look and say, there's another hand at work here. There's another voice at work here. There's another life source at work because these are just ordinary people. 
limited by the very limitations of, 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 of all of society, but yet something else had come into them, some kind of a new heart, some kind of a new mind, and a new spirit was upon them. You know, last Tuesday, I was, um, I was walking home after church, and uh, I happened to be walking behind two ladies from the choir in this church, and I, I watched them for a while. They were arm in arm under one umbrella, laughing and talking and having an incredible, like, if I was unsaved looking at this, I would say, this is, what an incredible thing for two people who, who might not really fully know each other, apart from the uh, church atmosphere, having so bonded together. And I know one of the ladies' testimonies, and it, it's a miracle this lady's living for God today. All that she's had to go through, but yet I see a heart that was open to another person in the body of Christ. And here they are, arm in arm, under one umbrella, laughing and talking and having just a great old time. It's the envy of everybody in New York City who walks down the street angry, <laughs> frustrated. Folks, we have an opportunity to be a testimony in our generation that is so deep. It's not what we say. It's not the tracks that we give out. It's who we are in Christ. How we have learned to interrelate one with another. In the body of Christ, we have an opportunity to be a testimony. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't walk anywhere near those two ladies and not have a sense that the, the hand of God is on this. How did they ever... These, your initial thought, if you didn't know them, is that they have to be sisters that are actually getting along. There's, there's, there could be no other reason for this kind of fellowship. And then we go down to the corner and there's always people on the corner of of uh, 51st and 8th uh, who just can't say goodbye. <laughs> you know, there, some are going down into the subway, some are going across down, they're going to continue down 8th, some are going over to Howard Johnson's and, uh, to get their car, but they just can't say goodbye. And folks, I, I love that. I love it when I see that in the body of Christ. <laughs> Th this bond, which, which should be in all of us, now, now, you could be the master of your own misfortune. If all you do is wait for the altar call so you can just run out the back door, then you're just authoring your own misfortune. The proverb says, whoever would have a friend must show himself friendly. And so when we say take time to get to know somebody, I really mean it. Not just shake a hand and just look, look at the first opportunity to get away from the person. To, to run out the door. It's been great meeting you. you know? <laughs> but to actually mean it. These, these are people here in this church of a hundred nations that you and I are going to know forever. We're going to know each other for all of eternity. Forever. forever. Why, why don't we let that bond? Why, why don't we let that bond be formed in us in the way that Christ would have it to be formed. David said it this way, bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. Bring me out of this place. That David said, though I'm surrounded by people on my left and on my right, I, God, I can't find any comfort here. I can't find anybody that really is even wanting to take the time to understand what's going on in my life. I, I, I I can't find refuge here. And that's not the way it's meant to be in the church of Jesus Christ. Bring my soul out of prison, he said, that I may praise your name. God, bring me out of this box that the enemy and my own culture and circumstance has me in. And break the sides out of this thing, oh God. And let me love people and let God open my heart to let other people love me. Jesus, you've got to do this. And David said, the righteous will compass me about, for you will deal bountifully with me. David said, I, I foresee a day when friends will be on all sides. I foresee a day of fellowship. I foresee a day of joy. I foresee a day of caring and compassion in, the, in this experience that God has given me and this calling he's put on my life. I, I foresee something of God with the righteous around me, with fellowship and what he foresaw was just ahead of him. He didn't realize that mighty men, mighty women of God were about to be born into the kingdom of God. God was going to give him fellowship, companionship. Yes, there'd be pain once in a while with it, but it was not going to be taken away from him.
And I thank God that you and I in this generation have an opportunity to break out of every prison. All the walls the devil has put around us because God established this church in Times Square for a divine purpose, for a reason. It's got to go deeper, folks. It has to go deeper than just a hundred different nationalities on the roll. In this church, it has to go deeper. It has to be something that lives among us. A testimony that's alive. A genuine care and compassion in this church. While the whole world is fragmenting around social status and race and culture. There's a body that's sovereignly coming together by the power of Almighty God. And I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to be on the outside of this looking in. I want to be right smack in the middle of it all and say, Lord, whatever walls are in my life, break them down. Whatever happened to me that causes me not to be able to bond, break it down. Whatever makes me want to preserve myself from being hurt again, break it down. Whatever is in me that causes me only to be comfortable with people that look like me and act like me and talk like me. Break it down, oh God. Break it down, oh God. Bring my soul out of this prison and surround me with the righteous. You said, Jesus, that this testimony of love and unity in the body would be a declaration in my generation of the reality of God. And so I'm not willing to settle with just church attendance. I'm not willing to settle for just, hi, how are you? See you next week. I want to go deeper and farther than all of this because that's what Christ has for me. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We need a miracle to see this happen. It can only come from the power of God. That's why Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach healings to the brokenhearted, deliverance to the captives, recovering a sight to the blind, and to set free those that have been bruised. It's all about a body, folks. It's about a church on the earth. It's about a people coming together in a bond of love and unity with God and with one another that is a testimony that cannot be denied in the earth. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Glory, glory, glory to the Lamb of God. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory. Hallelujah. Bring my soul out of prison. And God answered David's cry and brought him out and gave him a friend called Jonathan and others. He brought him out. He brought him out and he'll bring you out. You have to want to get up and you have to want to get out and you have to let the power of God come upon you and say, Lord, shake the place where I am and put a compassion in my heart and give me the strength to speak first and not stand in the lobby waiting for everybody to approach me. Give me the strength to speak first. Give me the strength to walk up to somebody and engage in a conversation. Give me the strength to reach out, not be afraid if if a person has a need, not be afraid to be willing to spend some time just letting them cry on my shoulder, just letting them talk about their kids, just praying with them about their family situation. God, help me to not keep everything at a casual level in the body of Christ. There's got to be something deeper than that. And as they prayed, the place was shaken and a sudden compassion comes on them, a sudden releasing of every, a sudden joy of being part of the body of Jesus Christ. We, we have lived short in many cases of what God has for us. It's there. The pearl is there, but you have to want it, folks. You and I have to want it. Now, if you're, if you're, if you're satisfied with just status quo church attendance, if you're satisfied with a casual nod and a handshake, then that's what you're going to get. But if you're not satisfied, what you're going to get is your prison door is going to open, where you are is going to be shaken, a supernatural touch of God is going to come on your life, and you're going to find yourself in a commitment to a people called the Church of Jesus Christ that you never believed was possible in your entire life. The glory of God will be at the center of it. The power of God to perform this will be at the very center of it. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Bring my soul 
out of prison. That's my altar call today for people who just say, God, I want, I hear this and I want this. I want a depth of friendship and fellowship in the body of Christ that you offer. I see it in the scriptures. You said it with, the, with your own mouth, Jesus, and I want this. I want it with all my heart. I don't want to be on the outside looking in all of my days. And you have to have the courage to get up and go forward and say, Lord, speak through me, heal through me, and love through me. It's that simple. If that's the cry of your heart, we're going to stand and we're going to worship for a few moments. And as we do, I'm going to ask those in the main sanctuary just to meet me, please, and one another at this altar. You're going to meet other people just like yourself who are looking to break out of the box and make a friend. It's that simple. Looking to get out of the confines of, of culture and experience to be able to learn to love other people of other races and other places. Folks, as we stand, would you just slip out and come to the altar? God bless you. Just make your way here, please, if you would. Those that the Holy Spirit is speaking to as we worship. In the balcony, go to either exit, if you will. In the annex, you could step between the screens and Roxbury as well. Praise God. Bring my soul. God, bring it out of prison. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes you, you see somebody in a store and they, they pick up something that's of incalculable value. And you can't help but shudder as they hold it in their hands. And you wonder, do they understand what they've got? And I wonder, do we really understand what God has done here? Do we really get the fact that this is one of the few congregations in the world today with this many people together of different races and backgrounds. And uh, folks, do you really understand? And so the, the thing is not to put it back on the shelf, but to handle it tenderly and to recognize the value of what God has given us. And to look at this altar today, and here are, here are a few hundred people that are trying to break out of the box. And they want to connect with somebody in the body of Christ, and they want this to be a meaningful experience being part of the church of Jesus Christ. And to the rest of us still in our seats, we're not going to let them down, folks. We're not going to let these people down in the days ahead. And some folks are just shy. It's hard. It's, you know, for those who are extroverted, it's hard to understand how some people are so shy. And it's just, it's, it's, it's almost terrifying to reach out and initiate a conversation. But these folks at this altar today are willing to at least take the step in that direction and be the first to speak. Don't be quick to write it off when it happens. You know, some people, it, it takes forever to get a sentence out. And those of us who are used to speaking can just say, yeah, that's great. Thanks. And just move away and not realize the sacrifice that that is. It's important to take time and listen and cherish those moments. Christ has given us a very, very precious possession in this house. Praise God. And you thought you were the only one that felt the way you do. You, the, the devil is lying to you and saying you're the only one. You just don't fit in. But there's a lot more. But we're going to break this. We're going we're gonna to bust this prison house. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to ask... Uh, Pastor Patrick, to come and grab a microphone, if you will, and uh, going to lead us in prayer. That all these barriers be broken. That we be given the empowerment to care one for another. And when we're done praying, I'm going to say to you, turn and make a friend, and I really mean it this time. <laughs> I really mean it. Not just a casual, I hope to see you again sometime. Uh, but how long, just a conversation, how long you been here? Uh, folks, just because the curtain comes down, you don't have to run out. There's no rush. There's no rush. They'll all be out there when you get there. And all of their hostility and everything else. So enjoy it while you can here in the house of the Lord. Pastor Patrick, love you. God, I thank God for you.
Pastor, I love you too. And I mean that. You know, as I was listening to him share his story in the very beginning and his experience, I, I was the same way. You know, it, I would never be able to say that. Uh, but I can say it genuinely today because of what God has done. And I'm normally, I'm normally an intro, uh, introvert. I am not an extrovert. Uh, uh, but God has given grace you know, to do what I've called to do. And I know with the uh, word we've heard today, uh, the marching orders that we've received as this army that God has raised up in this particular place at this particular time, his grace is going to see us through. Amen. His grace is going to see us through. The scripture says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. It's something, as we've heard, supernatural that God does. He carries us and he enables us to be what we could never be, to do what we could never do, to go where we could never go in our own strength. Amen. Let's lift our hands to him and my hands are lifted as well as yours to God. And Lord, we do thank you today for this incredible work that you are doing in this generation. Lord, this work that is a sovereign work. Lord, it's a work of your spirit in raising up your church, your bride, your people. Lord, as your body in this last hour of time, to be a light, to be a testimony. Lord, to be a family, a celestial family. Lord, in the midst of such darkness around us, in the midst of such hospitality, Lord, hostility, you're raising up a testimony. You're raising up a testimony to be salt and light. And Lord, even as we heard last week, God, we just thank you for your word today. Lord, we believe the report of the Lord. Today we believe, Lord, the report of the Lord. We believe that we are healed. We believe that we are free. We believe, oh God, that you've called us to make a difference. God, we reveal ourselves to you. We surrender ourselves to you this morning. And we ask, oh God, that you would bring down every wall. Your word says that you are our peace that has broken down every wall. God, and we thank you for that word today. We believe it, oh God. And Lord, now we're asking for the grace and believing you not only asking but believing you for the grace lord to walk lord and to do what you've called us to do and to be whom you've called us to be god we thank you for this lord we're believing that you will show us open doors lord and not only open doors and show us open doors and help us to see those open doors but god you're going to give us the grace to walk through those open doors lord lord to make a difference lord to reach out lord even out of, out of our comfort zones lord to be friendly and lord to make friends god thank you for this wonderful family you've given us god thank you for the love that you've bestowed upon us and lord for the body and the unity, Lord, that you're establishing in this place, Lord, and in this generation, Lord, to the glory of your name. Now, God, we thank you. Now, help us, Lord, and we thank you that you're going to help us, Lord Jesus, not to see men like trees walking, but to see everything the way you see it. God, we thank you and we bless you in advance. Lord, in the glory of your name, God, we rejoice today. And we thank you that the devil is defeated and that our God is exalted and that every stronghold of the enemy is broken. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, we give you glory. Hallelujah. Let's give him glory today. Hallelujah. 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 And folks, you know, sometimes you don't feel anything, but I'm going to tell you something. What I tell the young people on Friday night, there's a difference between faking it, because a lot of the young people don't want to fake it. So they don't praise God and they don't give the Lord thanks because they don't feel it. See, but there's a difference between faking it and faithing it. When you faith it, you can worship God, you can praise God, whether you feel like it or not, because you know who he is and what he has promised to you. Amen. The Lord bless you. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, turn and make a friend. Take time. We're not even going to sing. We're just going to let you do it. Just turn and make a friend. God bless you.